Um, the topic that we, um, Esther, we have chosen is a is a is a topic that defines actually Esther life. Is uh, innovation in education. It's a field that I'm probably the least expert, um, having been a, a thought person myself. Um, life was my school and taught me everything I know today. So as a self-made student, which I barely made it through the high school, um, and a self-made entrepreneur later, uh, I've always been driven by curiosity. Curiosity for me was the real, real driver. And uh, the same curiosity that made me live in five continents, the same curiosity that made me change so many jobs, the, the same curiosity that made me have the most unscalable career in a vast scale. Um, and it's the same curiosity that made me visit later on all the most important uh, academic institutions. I spent time at MIT, Stanford, my own town, Milano. I was invited by Bocconi, and it was fascinating to relive it, uh, uh, all of that later on. And even learning that, that some big professor like Joy Ito, that didn't go to school like me. So I'm not suggesting it for everybody, but I'm saying if I would have met Esther probably when I was at your age or even early, maybe I would have realized that I had a, a good career in, in school education. Um, you know, I was not interested in being told. That's the secret. You know, and I love what you guys are doing. I love your model because you, you teach themselves in a more collaborative approach and more collaborative way. And I think that's really the future, particularly with the speed of technology today. So without further ado, um, as a total outsider, I would like to introduce the person that has impressed me the most for the lifetime commitment to innovative education, Esther. So, um, I have been a teacher for 30 years, and um, I developed this system after the second year of teaching. So, the reason I developed the system is because I realized that my students weren't learning anything, but they were just sitting there doing what I told them to do, just because they had to do it or they would get a bad grade. And if they got a bad grade, then they'd get in trouble at home. So, I decided I didn't want to just be you know, one of those teachers that um, force people to do things. So this is what the system I created. So it, the reason it's called Moonshots in Education is I wrote this book called Moonshots in Education. And the reason I called it Moonshots in Education is because it took a lot of community work and a lot of effort to get to the moon. Tons of effort. And so I said, we have to expend that same amount of effort to change education and education in the world, the whole world, including Germany, has to be reformed. So um, the number one way that we reform education is basically changing the mindset of the educators. And you know, I'm very impressed with what you guys are doing because you have a collaborative model here. This is ex very unusual. And this is, I didn't even know about it before I came, but this is what I'm proposing. So my, <laughs> really happy I'm speaking to the choir. The only way to predict the future is to have the power to shape the future. And you have the power to shape the future. Because you have a, a whole university, a whole group here where you are working with peers. And you've got a lot of power. So my goal is to empower students so they shape the future. And I'm doing this in high school. So I think in Germany, you can also do this in high school. The high schools in all of Europe are very, um, let's see, top down, should we put it politely? You know, they tell you what to do all the time, and then if you don't do it, I mean, life is really bad. So there's a growing gap today between what business needs and what education provides. Let me tell you, that entire conference, DLD, that's all they're talking about. They're like, oh my god, we're training a whole generation of kids and they're not for the jobs we have. How could we be doing that? We're training them to take the tests, multiple choice tests. So in America today, young people are three times as likely as their parents to be out of work 
yet many employers cannot find people with the right job skills. So this is the book I wrote, Moonshots in Education, and it's how to close this gap. So the first part of the book um, was pretty interesting, and I'll tell you the middle part is already out of date because I gave a lot of links to websites that you can use to do it for educators, and then the last part of the book is probably the most boring because it is the history of tech and the, in education. And I'll tell you, in simple words, it didn't work. <laughs> So one of the problems, and one of the reasons it doesn't work is because all teachers worldwide, this is all they want to do, control the classroom. And this is the books you get as a teacher. These are books I got. They gave them to me. Classroom control. And look at what happens if you look classroom control on Google. 150 million results. Everybody's trying to control those students. It's terrible. <laughs> So, what is a moonshot? It means changing the mindset of the educator, changing the mindset of the teacher. They've already done it, you've done it here, but it's not all over Germany, it's pretty rare. So, the idea is to give students some control of their learning. In my classes, they have a lot of control of their learning. It's kind of like this, but I'm just trying to work with the system. So, that's why I say some control of learning. So, only 15 years ago, students had no choice. This was it. The teacher. <laughs> yep. The library. You guys are missing this. <laughs> Lucky. Um, and books. This is what you had to use to learn before. It was terrible, really. Um, today, we have, this is what we have. And I mean, everybody's done an encyclopedia in their pocket. So why are we forcing them to do the same old thing all over again? But we're still teaching in this model. This is the model. This is a real class with a real teacher. Notice how excited the students look. You know what this is? This is an advertisement for a whiteboard. And, <laughs> and it shows the teacher in total control. It's like, and the advertising to teachers, want to control your class? Here's how to do it. <laughs> this is your typical university. This was taken at Stanford University. This is also a part of Stanford. So I'm trying to change this teacher from the sage on the stage to the guide on the side. And actually, it'd be even better if the teacher could, you know, stay on the side the whole time, but they can't. So this is what the guide provides. This is a typical classroom. The infrastructure, the tools, the location, and the expertise. So I say, so this is in an effort to work with the system. Let's give students control 20% of the time. And it's just, it's a compromise with the old system where the professor is in total control. I, I think 20% is... A, the reason I did it is because, did you hear of the Google 20% time? So I thought, well, this is part of it, and I've worked with Google, I've been part of Google, so I thought 20% time for the, for the classroom. And a lot of teachers are accepting this. I thought it was like a foot in the door. So I called it Moonshot Mondays to start, or Genius Day or Passion Day, but actually it's interesting. I asked my students about it, and then they decided they don't like Monday after I already publicized it. I was like, what? I should have told me sooner. Anyway, they like Friday. So, they want to call it Moonshot Friday. It's like, okay, look, I don't care any day of the week's okay. Anyway, it looks like this. So this is a typical class, and notice the teacher is in the back there. This, these are my classes, and my students in a high school setting. And um, this is a... I'll tell you about it in a minute, but this is the building I have. This is, here's a student, of course, not paying the slightest bit of attention to me, which is <laughs> exactly what, you know, they're supposed to be working in groups. They were, and again, this is all, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you in a minute about exactly what I'm doing, but notice that there is no sort of students lined up in a row. It, they're collaborative working. So my idea is to empower students with these 21st century skills so they can control their future. And I'm going to rapidly go through all these skills because these are the skills you learn, which you are all learning now here, that you can't learn when you sit in rows and don't ask questions. 
creative thinking. You can't read a book about it. It's like, this is how to think creatively in a book. No. Or it's like, let me give you a book on how to ride a bike, okay? And they, all these things that they do, problem solving, technical skills, aesthetics and art, decision making, leadership and followership, these are all part of what you're learning. Resilience and grit, she just talked about it. Entrepreneurship, innovation, risk taking, project management, design thinking, tolerance, ethics, conflict resolution, curiosity and questioning, networking, how do you get there? These are skills that everybody wants in their employees and the system isn't doing it, isn't training it. So here's some real life examples. This is my program, Palo Alto High School Media Arts. Um, it has started, like I said, 1984, and this is the classroom of the future. This is what I started in. And I was there until just two and a half years ago. And this is really cute. It's called a portable. And I, the program can, uh, yeah. They, put me there. they actually spread me around the campus. So I had a lot of these little rooms. And so I went from one to the other to the other on a scooter. So <laughs> I was quite the popular teacher there. Anyway, <laughs> my whole program started on a typewriter using X-Acto knives. I used to hand them out to kids. And hot wax in 1984. And I today have, from those 19 kids, I have the largest media program in the United States. I have over 600 students, nine publications, five, actually this year, six media arts teachers, and, it's the large, and I'm using media as a way to train students to think and a way to train students with technical skills. And it's, I'm not trying to train a generation of journalists, although, you know, uh, as a byproduct, that's okay with me. But this is what the community decided to build, and that was after um, every single school board member had a student in my class. And they, were, they saw those classes. You saw what the build, buildings looked like. So now, this is what I have. Can you believe that? 25,000 square feet media arts center. The city of Palo Alto paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is a learning space. It's not like better than a classroom. And this is, we have, these are all the learning spaces in the building. And notice none of them are in rows. This is a, I have three of these computer labs and I have about 200 laptops. And this is what the classrooms look like. And notice all the chairs are on wheels. They're on purpose. It's like impossible to keep them in rows. So the kids can work collaboratively. These are not, this is another working space. And this is what the students produce. This is, uh, as I said, I'm not just trying to train journalists. This is the kind of work they produce, and they are all in charge of it. They do it all themselves. This is, it comes out every two weeks. It's 28 pages, three sections. It's, and it got, this publication has gotten gold crown from Columbia University, top of the nation, for several years running. So then I had too many kids, so I had to, this is their website, by the way. Notice they're a little concerned about the election situation in D.C. They weren't ready to revolt. <laughs> um, this is another publication. This, go, this one goes in the inside the, mat, the newspaper. It's like the New York Times T Magazine. It's the C Magazine. Everything is done by students. I just guide on the side. This is another one, as I said, of nine publications. Uh, this is a news magazine. Uh, and this comes out every month, so it's monthly. This is um, Foreign Affairs magazine. People thought, that, or the kids thought no one was listening to them, so they did their own magazine. And it's also, every single thing has a website. This is Photography magazine. This is a date website updated <coughs> daily. This is, we're on television. We broadcast the entire school every day. And, um, these are just a few of the graduates, and so, as I said, you don't necessarily have to be a journalist. Of course you're not. Here, not a journalist. Jeremy Lin, basketball player. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Lin Sanity. 
Jonathan Yee, filmmaker, Gotti Epstein, he was the reporter for The Economist in China. He just switched to New York, he's now covering media. Liz Gaines, she's a journalist for Recode. Um, he is just a, a social media influencer. This is my most famous student, well, one of them. Noah Snyder, reporter in the Ukraine for the New York Times. And here he is, James Franco, the actor. He wrote the introduction to my book. And so it's got a few little scandalous parts in there, and he wouldn't take them out, so I was like, okay, we'll just leave it in there. So <laughs> maybe nobody will read it. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, this is what he says in the book, and the fact is that I believed in him even though he might at that age not have believed in himself, and I use this entire pedagogy that I use. Everybody works together in a, as a team, and I, you can't get a bad grade in my class. You just have to redo what you started, and then you do it until you get it, and then get an A. So, <laughs> so this, and so now we're teaching a class together, actually, um, and we're making a movie. It's coming out this spring, Metamorphosis, he came back because he wanted to continue to teach. And then this is, um, these are just some of my students. This is a video, but it doesn't play right now because I guess it's not in the right platform. Um, and so this is in response to Sir Ken Robinson who says, schools kill creativity. And I, my response is, they don't have to kill creativity. It depends on how you treat the students and the the freedom and responsibility you give to the kids. And this is my method. This is encapsulated in a trick. My whole philosophy, trust, respect, independence, collaboration, and kindness. This is how students should be treated in all schools. And what I try to do, give students all the power so they can shape their future. And that's it. Thank you so much.